In this presentation, we're going to look at chapters 1 through 7 in the book of 2 Corinthians and see what teachings Paul gave to the Corinthians and how they apply to us. First of all, let's just take a look at a little introduction to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is Second Corinthians is not a definitive epistle. It does not analyze and summarize gospel doctrines such as, as such. Instead, it applies already known doctrines to the circumstances of the Corinthians, much as an inspired sermon applies the gospel to the congregation in which it is preached. Yet, wise counselor that he was, Paul woven sufficient doctrinal data to leave modern readers with a great sense of thanksgiving for the epistle. In it we read, among other things, of how God comforted and careth for his saints, of the law of reconciliation, that there is no second chance for salvation for the saints, of how God's ministers gain approval, of the true principle of glorying in the Lord, of false apostles and signs of true apostles, and we learn that Paul, like the three Nephites, was caught up into heaven and heard and saw things beyond mortal comprehension. Corinth was the meeting point of many nationalities because the main current of the trade between Asia and Western Europe passed through its harbors. Paul's first visit lasted nearly two years. His converts were mainly Greeks, gifted with a keen sense of the joys of physical existence, a passion for freedom, and a genius for rhetoric and logic, but reared in the midst of the grossest moral corruption, undisciplined and self-conceited. Sometime before 1 Corinthians was written, he paid them a second visit to check some rising disorder and wrote them a letter now lost. That's 1 Corinthians 5.9. They had also vis been visited by Apollos, Acts 18.27, perhaps by Peter, 1 Corinthians 1.12, and by some Jewish Christians who brought them letters of commendation from Jerusalem. Shortly after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, a riot developed in Ephesus in opposition to his teachings. See Acts 19.23-41. And he departed to Macedonia. It appears that while he was there, he wrote 2 Corinthians, likely about AD 57. In addition to 1 Corinthians, it is believed that Paul wrote two other letters before writing 2 Corinthians. We know about these letters because Paul mentions them. See 1 Corinthians 5, 9, 2 Corinthians 2, 3 through 4, verse 9, and chapter 7, verses 8 through 12. So we don't have all of the questions and answers and things back and forth to Corinthians that Paul was answering and trying to help the church with. We just happen to have these two specific books. There were other letters and books that... We, we, we just don't have that had never been kept. And so that kind of limits on what is he addressing? What was the background behind what he was trying to address? While Paul was in Macedonia, Titus brought him news from Corinth that an earlier letter had been sent, he had sent, had, well, had been well received by the saints there. See 2 Corinthians 7, 6, and 13. The Corinthian branch was making progress, but Paul also learned of false teachers there who were corrupting the pure doctrines of Christ. Sometime after Paul's initial visit to Corinth and a probable second visit, when Paul seems to have ch chastened some of the saints, 2 Corinthians 2.1 and 12.21, preachers from the Jerusalem area came to Corinth and began teaching the saints that they must adopt Jewish practices contrary to to Paul's teachings. Much of 2 Corinthian, Corinthians addresses the problem caused by these unwelcome teachers. Paul referred to them as false apostles and deceitful workers who are transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.13 Some of these men accused Paul of dishonest actions and even challenged his authority as an apostle. It just seems like things haven't changed much. We see that in the church even today, don't we? Paul's letter addressed both those who desired more of his words, 2 Corinthians 1-9, through 9, 
and those who had neither the desire to repent nor the inclination to accept his counsel. Most obvious in 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. In general, the text of 2 Corinthians reveals several purposes of this letter. One, to express gratitude and strengthen those saints who responded favorably to his previous letter. Two, to warn of false teachers who corrupted the pure doctrines of Christ. Three, to defend his personal character and authority as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. See 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. And four, to encourage a generous financial offering from the Corinthian saints to the impoverished saints at Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. In response to critics who questioned his apostolic authority and his doctrine, Paul shared autobiographical details of his life and wrote of his thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. While many of Paul's letters focus on doctrine, much of this letter emphasizes Paul's relationship with the Corinthian saints and his love and concern for them. Though Paul was firm in his opposition to critics, throughout 2 Corinthians we see him as a tender priesthood leader caring for the happiness and well-being of the saints. In this letter, Paul referred to what may have been the most sacred moment in his life. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4, Paul described himself as a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven where he saw and heard unspeakable things. This vision, taken together with his previous doctrinal statement concerning the degrees of glory in the resurrection, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 35-44, can be seen as a biblical parallel to Joseph Smith's vision recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 76. The book of 2 Corinthians may be a collection of several letters Paul wrote to the Corinthian saints. So with that, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. God comforts and cares for his saints. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 through 10, Heavenly Father is a God of comfort. As Paul wrote about the tribulation suffered by the saints, as recorded in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-10, he repeatedly, repeatedly used the words comfort, consolation, and delivered. God's comfort is a dominant theme throughout the first two chapters of 2 Corinthians. Paul related with strong and heartfelt language a severe trial he and his companions had suffered in Asia. See 2 Corinthians 1, 8-10 to teach that the Lord does not leave his followers to suffer alone. By relying on the Lord rather than just on himself, Paul was able to endure this time of deep despair. President Thomas S. Monson taught, in order to be tested, we must sometimes face challenges and difficulties. At times there appears to be no light at tunnel's end, no dawn to break the night's darkness. We feel surrounded by the pain of broken hearts, the disappointment of shattered dreams, and the despair of vanished hopes. We join in uttering the biblical plea, Is there no balm in Gilead? Jeremiah 8.22 says, We are inclined to view our own personal misfortunes through the distorted prism of pessimism. We feel abandoned, heartbroken, alone. If you find yourself in such a situation, I plead with you to turn to our Heavenly Father in faith. He will lift you and guide you. He will not always take away, he will all, let me try again. He will not always take your afflictions from you, but he will comfort and lead you with love through whatever storm you face. And that will be on his timing that he'll do that. And so you have to have faith in his timing. The word chasten relates to this. Chasten does not mean just does not just mean punishment, but also means learning things or learning by the things which we suffer. So chasten can mean learning through suffering. Doesn't mean to done anything wrong. Thus Mosiah 23, 21 through 22 states, Never the Lord the, nevertheless the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people. Yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. 
Nevertheless, whosoever putteth their trust, his trust in him, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. Yea, and thus it was with this people. End of Mosiah's quote. That is why all of our afflictions are not taken away from us, no matter how faithful we are. Like Christ, we too must learn obedience by the things which we suffer. See Hebrews 5.8. Yet God will comfort us through our tribulations. 2 Corinthians 1.4. 2 Corinthians 1.4. That we may be able to comfort them. In 2 Corinthians 1.4, Paul taught that those who had received God's comfort in their tribulations are then able to comfort others who have tribulations. The commitment to comfort others is a hallmark of our Christian discipleship and a requirement for baptism. See Mosiah 18.8-10. Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, to whom do we look in the days of grief and disaster for help and consolation? We look to men and women who have suffered, and out of their experience and suffering, they bring forth the riches of their sympathy and condolences as a blessing to those now in need. Could they do this had they not suffered themselves? Is not this God's purpose and cause in his children to suffer? He wants them to become more like himself. God has suffered far more than man ever did or ever will and is therefore the great source of sympathy and consolation. End of quote. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 93, verse 12, we read, And I, John, saw that he, Christ, received not of the fullness at the first, but received grace for grace. Grace is God's enabling power that is available to the righteous that enables them to do and endure more than what we can do on our own, such as overcoming sin through repentance, being justified, and to become sanctified because of the spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts that we may have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. That was Mosiah 5.2. God's grace is his enabling power that helps us to do things that we don't have the power to do. Whether that has to do with sin, whether that has to do with trials, whether it has to do with affliction, we receive grace for grace as we give grace in others. Maybe we have certain abilities and powers that others don't, and we could help lift them from their burden. So too then, as we show grace, meaning help enable others grow and succeed through their mortal afflictions, then we gain more power and ability from God's grace to help us grow and succeed. And so I keep growing from grace for grace. As I show grace to others, then God shows grace to me. That's why Mosiah said we are to bear one another's burdens. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 5-7 through seven. Those who suffer for Christ and his cause receive from him comfort and consolation, which drowns out and swallows up all sorrow and tribulation. 2 Corinthians 1, 8-10, verse 8, Paul is saying, for it is right, my friends, that you should know that I had to undergo very severe suffering in Ephesus and was even at death's door. Paul was, pre was pressed, weighed down exceedingly. The nature of this trouble is not exactly known. Verse 9, he is saying, This great danger taught me that my life is in the hand of God, the sentence of death, when he wondered whether the issue would be life or death, his own heart answered death. That maybe shows how hard the affliction was. He just wanted the relief, the relief of death to come. Verse 10, Paul is saying, His recovery taught him a stronger faith in God, for he saved me from the danger as he saves me continually. 2 Corinthians 1.11 Church leaders are strengthened by our prayers. The Corinthian saints brought comfort to the Apostle Paul through their prayers in his behalf, and he expressed his gratitude for their support. 2 Corinthians 1.11 
Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles also expressed to church members on behalf of all general authorities of the church his gratitude for their continual prayers and sustaining support. Not one of us could serve without your prayers and without your support. This is a quote from Elder Holland. Your total loyalty and your love mean more to us than we can ever possibly say. End of his quote. If apostles and apostles seek strength and comfort through the faithful petitions of church members, how much more need have the saints in general for the heaven-born pleadings of each other? 2 Corinthians 1, verses 12 through 14. Verse 12, Paul is saying, The apostles base his expectation of receiving their prayers on the purity and sincerity of his conduct, especially in respect of his treatment of them. Verse 13, he asserts that he writes nothing to them but what is common property, he namely, that they mutually understand and glory in one another. No other thing. That quote, Paul seems to have been suspected of writing to individual members of the church that he was not so satisfied with their conduct and attitude as he professed to be in his public leaders. In this verse 13, when he says, Reader acknowledged, that is, that he was now perfectly satisfied with them and they with him. In verse 14, some of them have acknowledged all this along, and he trusts that they will increasingly understand and sympathize one with one another until the relations be perfected at the coming of Christ. In part, meaning some had been faithful all the time. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, yea and nay. The difficult passage in 2 Corinthians 1, 15 through 20, appears to be Paul's response to an accusation that he had shown levity or light-mindedness. See 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, footnote A. In promising to first to visit Corinth, but then changing his travel plans. Some said he could not be trusted. One day he said yes, or yea, yes, I am coming. But the next day he said nay, no, I am not coming. Paul's critics seem to imply if we cannot trust Paul, how can we trust that he, was taught, uh, that he has taught us about God? Isn't that amazing? That maybe we don't understand how revelation works and sometimes that the brethren are learning just like we are. And they get an impression, or maybe they feel like they to do something, then the Spirit comes and tells them, no, and that is good, but there's something better I have more for you. And we think it looks like they're, they're waving back and forth when they're really not. We are just void of the Spirit and don't understand what they are going through. Uh, we, we need to do a better job of that in the church and not... Expect perfection out of the apostles, unless they can expect perfection out of you. In response to this allegation, Paul declared that the message he and his companions taught was true, and that God and Jesus Christ are trustworthy and do not vary. Jesus is always yea, the fulfillment or amen to all God's promises. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22, anointing and sealing. Paul stated that he and his missionary companions had been anointed and sealed by God. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22. The anointing could have referred to an anointing with oil similar to that received by kings and priests and prophets in the Old Testament, setting them apart for their divinely ordained work. But the word may simply mean that God had given Paul the Holy Spirit with the abundant blessings that accompany that gift. That meaning seems to fit Paul's reference to the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 1.22. The Greek word Paul used to indicate being sealed by God means that God had placed his stamp of ownership upon him. Therefore, showing also the God's approval that he was a true and elite an apostle. Second Corinthians one twenty two, 
or chapter 5, 5, the earnest of the spirit. According to the Bible dictionary, the word earnest means a pledge or security. The word thus translated is a commercial term denoting the deposit paid by a buyer on entering into an agreement for the purchase of anything. As used by Paul, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 and 5, 5, or Ephesians 1, 14, it means that the Lord gives us his Holy Spirit in this life as a foretaste of the joy of eternal life. The Spirit is also the Lord's surety that he will fulfill his promise to give eternal life to the faithful. When we feel the Lord, Spirit of the Lord, we can know that we are accepted of the Lord and that his promises are in effect in our lives. So some of those special moments we have with the Holy Ghost and we feel it strongly in our lives is his deposit, so to speak, to show, look what you're getting now. What can you imagine what it's going to be when you have this in a fullness? 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 23. Verse 23, Paul is saying, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul. Another reason for the apostles' change of plans was considered for their feelings. Verse 24, For I have no desire to lord it over you, but only to help your Christian life. Dominion probably refers to an accusation made by the Judaizers, that would be Jews that have converted to Christianity, but still believe in following the law of Moses, made the Judaizers that Paul was lording it over them, by faith ye stand, that phrase is a difficult phrase, perhaps it means you need no master over you, for you are grounded in the faith, or your faith is sufficient strength, security, and support. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Saints should love and forgive one another. 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4, leaders chasten church members out of love. In 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4, Paul acknowledged that some of his writings in a previous epistle could have seemed harsh because he was chastening the members. Prophets of all ages has carried the responsibility to teach, warn, and correct God's children. See Jacob 2.2 2 in the Book of Mormon. President Brigham Young taught about why church leaders may sometimes appear to be harsh in their counsel. Quote, At times I may to many of the brethren appear to be severe. I sometimes chasten them, but it is because I wish them to live so that the power of God like a flame of fire will dwell within them and be round about them. End of quote. 2 Corinthians 5 through 11, the importance of forgiving others. We gain an insight into Paul's love and compassion from 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11. We do not know whether the transgressor Paul referred to is the one mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 or another offender, perhaps one of the false teachers in Corinth who had opposed Paul in his teachings. Paul encouraged church members to forgive the man and comfort him so that he would not be swallowed up with much sorrow, 2 Corinthians 2, 7. However, any so rebuke should be showed, showered, I'm sorry, with an increase of love, lest enmity and ill will remain in the hearts of the saints. Further, the saints should forgive one another their trespasses in the true spirit of Christian love and forbearance. Speaking of the heartfelt forgiveness needed by the Corinthians and other ancient modern saints, the Lord said this in our dispensation. This is Doctrine and Covenants 64, 8 through 10. My disciples in days of old sought occasion against one another and forgave not one another in their hearts. And for this evil they were afflicted and sorely chastened. Wherefore I say unto you that you ought to forgive one another. For he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses standeth condemned before the Lord. For there remaineth in him the greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive. Only God can choose who can be and not be forgiven. But of you it is required to forgive all men. End of quote. Why would there be a greater sin in us? It is because not forgiving others, what we are saying to Jesus Christ is, I do not believe 
that you are the Christ and that you are just and there will be justice and I don't trust you to take care of it. That's what we're saying when we do not forgive. Elder C. Max Caldwell of the 70 and Lauren G. Otten discussed the dangers of withholding forgiveness from others. Quote, when we take the position of withholding forgiveness from our fellow men, we are tempting to block his progress towards salvation. This position is not Christ-like. We are endeavoring to impede the progress of a living soul and deny him the forgiving blessings of the atonement. This philosophy is saturated with impure motives that are designed to destroy the soul. And so there's another reason why you would have the greater transgression when you don't forgive. You would have the greater sin. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. That phrase, Paul knew that if the Corinthian saints failed to forgive the man who had received church disciplinary action, there would be increased discord among them. See 2 Corinthians 2.11. Satan had gained one victory when the man sinned. If the saints failed to forgive the repentant man, Satan would have had another victory. Paul was teaching the saints how to avoid allowing Satan to get an advantage of us. 2 Corinthians 2.11 One of the ways we receive strength to overcome Satan is to understand the ways he seeks to mislead the children of men. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency said, Quote, Satan's most strenuous opposition is directed at whatever is most important to the Father's plan. Satan seeks to discredit the Savior and divine authority, to nullify the effects of the atonement, to counterfeit revelation, to lead people away from the truth, to contradict individual accountability, to confuse gender, just think of that. This was written back in 1993, and look how that is such an issue today. To confuse gender, to undermine marriage, and to discourage childbearing, especially by parents who will raise children in righteousness. End of his quote. 2 Corinthians 2, 14-17 For we are unto God a sweet savor unto, of Christ. After teaching that saints should love and forgive each other, Paul taught more about the characteristics of disciples of Jesus Christ. He declared that God would always support his saints, causing them to triumph in Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.14 He then drew upon the imagery of sacrifices and incense burned in the temple when he said that the saints are, quote, unto God a sweet savor of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 or 2.15 the smoke of temple offerings was described as a sweet savor to God because it showed they were doing God's will. You can see that in Exodus 29, 18, Leviticus 1 through 9, 13, 17, and Numbers 15, 7. Similarly, the lives of righteous saints represented an offering that was pleasing to, to God, for they were becoming like Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, 15. Verse 16 described the effects that the saints and the gospel of Jesus Christ had upon listeners. To Christ's enemies, the sweet fragrance of the saints and their witness of Christ was like the savor of death. But to those who accepted the apostles and their teachings, it was the savor of life. When Paul asked, and who is sufficient for these things? He recognized that no person is sufficient to represent the Savior unless he has the Savior's grace to help him. And he declared that he and other disciples did not corrupt the word of God, but with, but with sincerity in the sight of God speak we in Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 2, 16 through 17. The word corrupt, as used in Corinthians 2.17, is taken from the Greek word for a peddler. It referred specifically to persons who sold impure or adulterated goods. As an apostle of Jesus Christ, Paul did not preach the gospel for money, nor adulterate its message, as some were doing in Corinth at the time. 
Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve said concerning the effects we can have upon listeners, quote, when we truly love God, we are released from the cruel constraints of our own egos. As our capacity to love increases, we go beyond the giving of time and talents and means onto the full giving of self. Presently, so many of us send checks where we are not willing to go. So many of us give our time, but our hearts and minds are elsewhere. Pro progress in relation to the first commandment will also bring us even closer to having the mind of Christ, with no disposition to bear false witness against another and no desire to defraud. See 2 Corinthians 2.16 As we learn so to love, we will become more lovable making much less taxing the tasks others have of loving us. Our neighbors will be better treated as we become better, for righteousness is more self-reinforcing than evil is. One will neither covet what a neighbor has nor shrink from truthfully warning a neighbor. The same tough love one applies to himself will not condescendingly be withheld from a neighbor who may need us to level with him before he can be lifted up. Even enemies are prayed for, since ultimately there are no enemies among our brothers and sisters. True, some friendships have yet to be formed. Some deep differences have yet to be d dissolved. Some tongues still bear false witness. But those same tongues will one day openly confess that Jesus is the Christ with all that acknowledgement implies. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. God is anxious to take us, oh, I'm sorry, this is the end of it. God is anxious to take us as far as we who are weak are willing to go in this journey towards perfection. God, God is not going to force us to go further than we want to go. If we don't want him around, he says, fine, I will not be around you. He honors our agency. Back to the quote. It will not be he who disappoints. He knows our possibilities and will not settle for less, though, alas, we may. He knows what we need, while we merely know what we want. Oh, you got to love Elder Maxwell. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the gospel surpasses the law of Moses. 2 Corinthians 3, in all parts of the primitive church, Corinth, Rome, Galatia, everywhere, the need existed to remind the saints that the law of Moses was done away in Christ. In Jerusalem, in the old country, they had an extremely hard time. The Nephites made the change just automatically because they saw the deadness of the law, that it couldn't save you, that it was only a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. And so when he finally came, they were glad to finally be done with it and move on to a higher law. Since the gospel went first to the Jews and thereafter to other lineages, there were in all parts of the new kingdom those who had been subject to the old Mosaic system, a system which some of them found it hard to give up fully and without mental reservation. It is much the same today where congregations of new converts are concerned. These new church members come from the sects of, sects of Christendom into the living kingdom of power and glory. Their baptism does not automatically cause them to forget all they have known and believed and perhaps taught. In the very nature of things, and almost without being aware of it, some of them still retain fragments of those sectarian vagaries inherent from their fathers. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 2. Some judge the church by its members' examples. In response to those who opposed him and tried to discredit him in Corinth, Paul asked rhetorically, Do I really need letters of commendation approving that I am a legitimate apostle? See 2 Corinthians 3 1. In this question, Paul referred to the ancient practice of carrying letters of commendation when visiting a new community. See Acts 18.27. Such letters usually introduced people, testified of their character, and witnessed that they were not intruders or impostors. Paul then declared that the transformed lives of the saints into Corinth 
already constituted the best kind of letter of commendation, verifying that Paul had proper authority, for the saints' changed lives were like an epistle from Christ himself. See 2 Corinthians 3, 2-3, two, two, three, and also 1 Corinthians 9, 2. Paul's declaration that members of the church will all were like epistles read of all men suggests that the personal conduct of church members is the way many first come to know the church and judge its truthfulness. Just as a shopkeeper is judged by the goods he sells, so the church, and sometimes even Jesus Christ, is judged by the lives we live. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Twelve taught, in the ultimate sense, the gospel is not written on tablets of stone or in books of scripture, but in the bodies of faithful and obedient persons. The saints are thus living epistles of the truth, the books of whose lives are open for all to read. How we conduct ourselves is really what we think of the true gospel and what we show to others. President Gordon B. Hinckley added, quote, The only thing that can ever embarrass this work are acts of disobedience to its doctrine and standards by those of its membership. That places upon each of us a tremendous responsibility. This work will be judged by what the world sees of our behavior. God gives us the will to walk with faith, the, dis the discipline to do what is right at all times and in all circumstances, the resolution to make our lives a declaration of this cause before all who see us. End of quote. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3, fleshly, f fleshy tablets of the heart phrase. Paul taught that while the commandments of the law of Moses had been written upon stone tablets, the Spirit of the living God can write the gospel in the fleshly tablets of the heart. See 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. President Russell M. Nelson explained that when doctrines of the gospel are written in the fleshly tablets of our hearts, many people throughout the world have kind feelings towards the church because of the acts of kindness and service they see manifest in the lives of church members. See 2 Corinthians 3 2. Moses the Lawgiver by Ted Henninger. The commandments had once been written on tablets, but the Spirit of the living God can write them in the fleshly tablets of the heart. 2 Corinthians 3 3. They become an integral part of our nature. End of quote. In the ultimate sense, the gospel is not written on tablets of stone or in books of scripture or in the bodies of faithful and obedient persons. The saints are thus living epistles of the truth. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. They are not written on tablets of stone nor in books of scriptures, but in the bodies of faithful and obedient persons. The saints are thus living epistles of the truth, the books of whose lives are open for all to read. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 5, verse 4, It is such a result of my work as I see in you that assures me that God is using me as an instrument of Christ. Verse 5, Paul is saying, Not that I trust in my personal ability, but that I look to God for help. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6, The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Paul declared to the Corinthian saints that he was a minister of the New Testament, meaning the new covenant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He referred to the old covenant, which was the law of Moses, as the letter, and the new covenant as the spirit. Quentin L. Cook, Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, appalled Paul's words to our need to understand the spirit or why to understand the spirit or why of God's commandments. Quoting, doctrine usually answers the question why. Principles usually answer the question what. Whenever we emphasize how to do something without reference to why we do it or what we do, we risk losing, going, looking beyond the mark. At the very least, we fall into the trap Paul described to the Corinthians, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. 
Elidal and H. Oaks, at the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, has used the example of teaching our ironic priests and deacons the doctrines and principles of sacrament meetings so that they will understand that the rules that they follow, such as dressing appropriately and passing the sacrament in a non-distracting way, support what the Lord would have us accomplish in sacrament meeting, renewing our covenants and remembering the atonement in a reverent manner. In many areas, we are guided only by doctrine and principles rather than rules. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, I teach some correct principles and they govern themselves. Edler Oaks finishes with, we are responsible to the Lord for how we respond in such situations. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 17, Jeremiah's prophecy of the new covenant fulfilled. The Greek word, and I know I won't say this right, diathekes, translated in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 and 14 as testament, carries the primary meaning of covenant. Thus, when Paul used this word, he was not referring specifically to the New Testament, but to the new covenant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Paul referred to the reading of the Old Testament, 2 Corinthians 3, 14, he was referring to the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law contained in the pages of what Christians call the Old Testament. When Paul taught that, new con- that the new convert would be written on, on let me, I apologize. When Paul taught that the new covenant would be written on people's hearts, see 2 Corinthians 3:3, 3, 3, he was pointing to the fulfillment of a prophecy of Jeremiah, which said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 31, verses 31-33. Paul also drew upon Old Testament imagery when discussing a veil over Moses' face and a veil over the hearts of the people when they read from the Scriptures. Paul was teaching that in his day, Israel was blinded in its understanding of the law of Moses. They had a veil of covering. They had turned the law of Moses into what would save you instead of the law of Moses teaching you about Christ, and then Christ would save you. The Joseph Smith translation of 2 Corinthians 3.16 states that, When the heart of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord, the veil, that means of misunderstanding, shall be taken away. This is true of everyone whose hearts turns to the Lord, for the Spirit enables them to understand the Scripture and the Gospel in fullness. See 2 Corinthians 3, 16-17. Orthodox and other Jews even in our day know thoroughly the words of the Hebrew Bible. They know it backwards and forwards, yet they do not understand it completely. There is a veil over their mind still. Nevertheless, when they shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. That's in verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter 3.17, the Spirit of the Lord brings liberty. Paul taught that when the veil of blindness is taken away from our hearts, the Spirit of the Lord brings liberty into our lives. See 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Those who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ are freed from the captivity of the adversary. President Gordon B. Hinckley testified, quote, The gospel is not a philosophy of repression, as so many regard it. It is a plan of freedom that gives discipline to appetite and direction to behavior. Its fruits are sweet, and its rewards are liberal, end of quote. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, The church is constantly concerned with one of the ultimate dimensions of freedom, that is freedom from sin. We share the world's concern with political and economic freedom, the more visible and tra- traditional dimensions of freedom. Paul said, however, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Jesus said, The truth shall make you free. free. John 8.32 It is so easy to become imprisoned in the single cell lit, single well lit cell 
It is so easy to become imprisoned in the single well-lit cell of one's impulse and one appetite. Elder Bruce R. McClunky taught that it is Satan, not God, who seeks to destroy the agency and liberty. Quote from Elder McClunky, quote, It is an eternal principle that he existed with God from all eternity that man should be free. God ordained the law of agency in the premortal life so that his spirit children could either follow him or rebel against his law and go to perdition with Lucifer. Then in this mortal probation, man again was given freedom of choice, freedom to gain salvation by obedience or to be damned through disobedience. Since Satan always seeks to destroy the agency of man, he influences churches and governments to deny freedom of worship and to force men to perform acts contrary to the divine will. Governments and churches which curtail or deny man the power to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience are not of God. They are not directed by the power of his spirit. Let's now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Gospel light shines on the saints. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, As a mirror reflects the likeness of a person, so the saints should reflect the image of Christ. And as they progress in obedience and personal righteousness, they attain this image by the power of the Spirit. They become like Christ. The Spirit is the means by which God gradually transforms us into glorious beings like Him. Alma similarly taught that when we are spiritually born of God, we receive his image in our countenance, Alma 5.14. The phrase glory to glory could also be translated as with increasing glory or to higher degrees of glory, thus suggesting man's potential to gradually become like Heavenly Father. Furthermore, when we become the children of Christ, we begin to take on the image, countenance, and characteristics of of our spiritual father, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, the word, the, the, the God of this world. The God of this world is Satan, who blinds people's eyes and hides the gospel from those who are spiritually lost. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Twelve helped us understand Peter's reference, quote, this world is the sensual, carnal, and devilish society of men who live on the face of the earth. It is a world that shall continue to exist until Christ comes and the wicked are destroyed, which destruction is the end of the world. Hanging the word of God deceitfully. That quote means twisting and perverting the scriptures preaching false doctrine, proclaiming any doctrine other than the doctrine of Christ. Unless professing ministers have the fullness of the gospel, they are themselves deceived, and they must of necessity practice deception in maintaining their false system of religion. All men have sufficient spiritual talent to believe and understand the gospel, but some are deceived, some reject the light, some are lost. Even many honorable men of the earth are blinded by the craftiness of men and shall obtain nothing higher in eternity than a terrestrial inheritance. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5-10 through 10, Troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Paul compared himself and his fellow ministers of the gospel to ordinary-looking clay jars that contain the treasure of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. See 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. Paul stated that the contrast between humble, unimpressive missionaries and the light they bear of the gospel of Jesus Christ reveals a divine purpose that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. In chapter 6, 4 through 10, and chapter 11, 23 through 33, contain Paul's account of many of the perils he experienced as a missionary and apostle of Jesus Christ. Though many of these perils were extreme, Paul testified that because he was always supported by God, he was able to continue to be of service to God and the saints. 
and Geoffrey R. Holland of the Twelve explain that Paul's description of his trials found in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, can also be used to describe the Savior's great sufferings. On some days, we will have cause to remember the unkind treatment the Savior received, the rejection he experienced, and the injustice, oh, the injustice he endured. When we too then face some of that in life, we can remember that Christ was also troubled on every side, but not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. End of his quote. President George A. Smith of the First Presidency received counsel in the spirit of Paul's inspiring words from his cousin, the prophet Joseph Smith, at a time of great difficulty. Quoting George A. Smith, he, Joseph Smith, told me I should never get discouraged. Whatever difficulties might surround me, if I was stuck in the lowest pit of Nova Scotia and all the rocky mountains piled on top of me, I ought not to be discouraged, but hang on, exercise faith, and keep up good courage, and I should come out on top of the heap at last. End of quote. And so did Joseph Smith fulfill that, all that was heaped upon him, and he came out, out on top with glorious power. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Mortal trials, persecution, sufferings, even the laying down of one's life for the cause of Christ, are as nothing compared to the immortal glory reserved for those who endure all things well. All things are part of the Lord's program for testing his saints to the full. Quoting the Lord, I will try and prove you herewith, he says, who are, and who so layeth down his life in my cause, for in my name's sake shall find it again, even life eternal. Therefore be not afraid of your enemies, for I have decreed in my heart, saith the Lord, that I will prove you in all things, whether you will abide in my covenant even unto death that you may be found worthy. For if ye will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy of me. As Doctrine and Covenants 98, 12 through 15. This glorious gospel is entrusted indeed to frail and suffering messengers. But that is in order that the glory may be given not to man, but to God. Life is, continually afflic is a continual affliction and danger but it enables the apostle to learn how to comfort and edify the Corinthian converts, and he gladly suffers that he may learn the salvation of God and glory his holy name, while he is upheld by the hope of the resurrection of life. 2 Corinthians 4, 8-9, Neil A. Maxwell said, The summer is taking its toll. But even in the heat of the final summer, we can come to know the deep assurance that Paul described when he said, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Why? Because we are grounded, rooted, established, and settled. We can be in withering circumstances and yet not wither. We can endure the heat of that special summer. You catch it, brothers and sisters? The summer, the heat of the, the second coming and all of the affliction that will come with it, we can endure if we're grounded, rooted, and established and settled in the gospel. With Paul, we can say we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. This is continuing Elder Maxwell persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. Perhaps we can add, we are challenged but not surprised. We are falsely accused but pray for our accusers. We are reviled but are resplendent with Christian service. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 10 through 12. In verse 10, Paul is saying the Lord Jesus is our prototype. As a mortal, he suffered all things, even death, and was then raised in immortal glory. If we endure in like manner, we also shall come forth in the resurrection and receive glory and honor with him. 
In suffering for Christ's sake, we are drawn into close communion with him who suffered and died on our behalf, and thus sharing his experience and having his mind in us, at which was also in him, we are enabled to show forth in our life the power of Christ, whose indwelling influence gives us the victory over the temptations which these trials bring. Verse 11, Paul says, is saying, Indeed, it is for this very purpose that we are constantly brought into peril and affliction. And in verse 12, he is saying, And the result is that, while we suffer and draw near even to death itself, your spiritual life is strengthened by the spectacle of our spiritual victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13-16 through 16. Verse 13, our faith is like that of the psalmist who spoke out of the depths of his inward conviction, and we speak what we verily believe. Verse 14, Paul was saying, for we are confident that God who, ra God who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, will raise also and unite us with you in the blessings of the resurrection of life. 15, and all my experiences are a source of blessing to you. Because as the grace of God enables me to overcome my difficulties, many of you are inspired by my testimony to rise to higher levels of Christian life and to give thanks to God for so many mercies. Verse 16, Paul goes on to speak of things that comfort him in the presence of his trials. These are the strengthening of his spirit, the thought that the temporal is transient, and the assurance of a future life. 2 Corinthians 4.17, keeping our mortal afflictions in perspective. Elder Paul D. Johnson of the 70 used Paul's words to help us put our mortal afflictions into an eternal perspective. Quote, the Apostle Paul taught, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. It is interesting that Paul uses the term light affliction. This comes from a person who was beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, imprisoned, and experienced many other trials. See 2 Corinthians 11, 23-28. I doubt many of us would label our afflictions light. Yet in comparison to the blessings and growth we ultimately receive, both in this life and in eternity, our afflictions truly are light. President Brigham Young taught, all intelligent beings who are crowned with crowns of glory, immortality, and eternal lives must pass through every ordeal appointed for intelligent beings to pass through to gain their glory and exaltation. If we obtain the glory of Abraham obtained, we must do so by the same means that he did. If we are ever prepared to enjoy the society of Eni, Noah, Melchizedek, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or of their faithful children and of the faithful prophets and apostles, we must pass through the same experience and gain the knowledge, intelligence, and endowments that will prepare us to enter into the celestial kingdom of our Father and God. Every trial and experience you have passed through is necessary for your salvation. It can, Another quote by Brigham Young, It is recorded that Jesus was made perfect through suffering. If he was made perfect through suffering, why should we imagine for one moment that we can be prepared to enter into the kingdom of rest with him and the Father without passing through similar ordeals? Trials will come, brothers and sisters. Some that will break our hearts tremendously. And they are all meant to be. And God may even inflict them upon us for our benefit and salvation. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, keep on, oh, continuing that, President John Taylor reiterated the words of the prophet Joseph Smith, quote, you will have all kinds of trials to pass through, and it is quite as necessary for you to be tried as it was for Abraham and other men of God, and God will fill after you, 
and he will take hold of you and wrench your very heartstrings. And if you cannot stand it, you will not be fit for an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, God will wrench our very heartstrings. He will put us through experiences that will just tear our hearts apart. Can we stay faithful to him during those moments? That is what we will get to be seen. That is what we must do if we're going to be fit for the celestial kingdom. President George Q. Cannon taught, Every Latter-day Saint who gains a celestial glory will be tried to the very utmost. If there is a point in our character that is weak and tender, you may depend upon it that the Lord will reach after that. And we will be tried at the spot for the Lord will test us to the utmost before we can get through and receive that glory and exaltation which he has in store for us as a people. Elder Spencer W. Kimball wrote, Being human, we would expel from our lives physical pain and mental anguish and assure ourselves of continual ease and comfort. But if we were to close the doors upon sorrow and distress, we might be excluding our greatest friends and benefactors. Suffering can make saints out of people as they learn patience, long-suffering, and self-mastery. End of his quote. The phrase in 1, 2 Corinthians 4.17, a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory meaning exaltation as a result of the continuation of the family unit in eternity. Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, verses 15 through 16, says, Therefore, if a man marry him a wife in the world, and he marry her not by me nor by my word, and he covenant with her so long as he is in the world, and she with him, their covenant and marriage are not of force when they are dead, and they are out of the world. Therefore, they are not bound by any law when they are out of the world. Therefore, when they are out of the world, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are appointed angels in heaven, which angels are ministering servants, to minister for those who are worthy of a far more and exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See how Doctrine and Covenants uses the exact same phrase as Paul which means that Paul is probably referring to celestial marriage. Paul's application of the term to himself is one of a great number of indicators that he was married. Let's now go to chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians. Saints walk by faith and seek tabernacles of immortal glory. 2 Corinthians 5, 1-4, through 4, desiring to be clothed upon with the resurrected body. In both ancient and modern times, some people have mistakenly believed that the physical body is a negative thing and that a disembodied state, living on, as a spirit only, is preferable. When writing to the Corinthians, Paul expressed his desire not to be rid of a mortal body, but to be clothed upon with an immortal, resurrected body. Susan, Sister Susan W. Tanner, while serving as young woman general president, spoke of her newly born granddaughter and of the feelings of holiness she felt in the presence of a celestial spirit, newly united with a pure physical body. Our bodies, she says, are our temples. We are not less, but more like Heavenly Father because we are embodied. I testify that we are his children, made in his image, with the potential to become like him. Let us treat this divine gift of the body with great care. Some day, if we are worthy, we shall receive a perfected, glorious body, pure and clean like my new little granddaughter, only inseparably bound to the Spirit, and we shall shout for joy to receive this gift again for which we have longed. An house made not with hands, eternal in the heavens, probably means, quoting Doctrine and Covenants 29, verse 43, an immortal body, one that houses the spirit eternally and dwells in the realms of glory. The saints desire to be raised in immortality unto eternal life, that is, to come forth in the resurrection and be clothed with the robes of righteousness. 
And I said that's Doctrine and Covenants 2943. 2 Corinthians 5 5, when Paul says, He that hath wrought us, Paul here argues for immortality and the resurrection life from the instinctive longings of the human heart. God has pl planted these longings there. He has confirmed them by the pledge of his spirit in conscious aspiration and all spiritual blessings, and he will not in the end disappoint us. 2 Corinthians 5, 6-7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Paul taught that while we are in our mortal bodies, we are absent from the Lord, meaning that in mortality we are not in the personal presence of God. While we are on earth, we must walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 6-7. Part of God's plan is that when we are born, a veil is placed over our minds to cover the memory of our pre-mortal heavenly home. Without the memory of our pre-mortal life, we seek to learn and live by faith. If we follow the path of our Savior exemplified, our Heavenly Father's richest blessings will be ours. As President Wilford Woodruff testified, quote, When we get to the other side of the veil, we shall know something. We now work by faith. We have the evidence of things not seen. The resurrection, the eternal judgment, the celestial kingdom, and the greatest blessings that God has ever given in the holy anointings and endowment in the temple are all for the future, and they will be fulfilled, for they are eternal truths. We will never in the flesh with this veil over us fully comprehend that which lies before us in the world to come. I will pay any man to serve God and keep his commandments to the few days he lives upon the earth. Mortality is a time of testing, trials, and faith, but eternal glory will be our reward. Wherefore, dispute not, because you see not, for you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. Ether 12.6 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 through 11, we will appear before Christ to be judged. After teaching that we must walk by faith in this life, that we should seek to obtain an immortal resurrected body, and that we should labor to be accepted by Jesus Christ, Paul taught that we will stand, all stand before Christ to be judged for the things which we have done in mortality, whether good or bad. Paul taught, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, meaning that because Paul and his companions feared or reverenced the Lord and knew they were accountable to him, they labored to persuade others to prepare for that great day of judgment. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote about the Savior's role at the judgment day, saying, The Son, not the Father, is the judge of the whole earth, but his judgment is made in accordance with the will of the Father and therefore is just. Because Jesus is the Son of Man of Holiness, he has been given the power to execute judgment, to sit in judgment at the great and last day, to call all men forth in immortality to stand for his bar. This passage, verse 10 in 1 Corinthians 5, sounds as though Paul had read the Book of Mormon on this doctrine. In 3 Nephi 26, 4, it says, And even unto the and even unto the great and last day when all people and all kindreds and all nations and all tongues shall stand before God to be judged of their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. In Alma 11.41, Therefore the wicked remain as though there had been no redemption made, except it be the loosening of the bands of death. For behold, the day cometh that all shall rise from the dead and stand before God and be judged according to their works. 2 Corinthians 5.12, we commend not ourselves. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. As from Proverbs 27.2, we should not boast of ourselves. Them which glory in appearance and not in heart, Paul was meaning, the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart for Samuel 16 7 so that's what that phrase was referring to the Joseph Smith translation of 2nd Corinthians 15 3 says for we bear record and the bold is the part that Joseph has added for we bear record that we are not beside ourselves 
For whether we glory, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your sakes. Quite a bit different than what is in the King James. 2 Corinthians 5, 14-17, New Creatures in Christ. Paul taught that if there, are, if there were no atonement of Jesus Christ, then we then were, then were all dead spiritually. The atonement changes everyone who accepts it. Those who choose to follow Jesus Christ no longer live unto themselves, but unto him, Christ, which died for them and rose again. They become new creatures. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught what it means to be a new creature in Christ. The essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ entails a fundamental and permanent change in our very nature made possible through the Savior's atonement. True conversion brings a change in one's belief, heart, and life to accept and conform to the will of God and includes a conscious commitment to become a disciple of Christ. As we honor the ordinances and covenants of salvation and exaltation, press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, and endure in faith to the end, we become new creatures in Christ. The Joel Smith translation of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth, live we no more after the flesh, Yea, though we once lived after the flesh, yet since we have known Christ, now henceforth we now henceforth live we no more after the flesh. Again, making some significant changes. After baptism, all followers of Christ become new creatures. Our carnal natures are destroyed, and we are spiritually reborn. As Mosiah 5, 7 says, And now because of the covenant baptism, which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and become his sons and his daughters. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18-21 through 21, Be ye reconciled of God. After teaching that all people are accountable for their actions and will one day stand before Jesus Christ to be judged, Paul pleaded with the Corinthian saints to be reconciled to God through the atonement of Christ. There are only a few biblical verses that explicitly state that Jesus Christ was completely without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one of them. Verse 21 is also one of the clearest scriptural statements on the purpose of the atonement and the way we are reconciled to God. Paul taught, For he hath made, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness in him. In other words, as a result of his atonement, Jesus Christ can say to us, I will take your sins and I will give you my righteousness. God, what a bargain, brothers and sisters. Can you believe that? Why wouldn't you believe in such a being? Jesus Christ became a vicarious sacrifice for our sins, meaning that all of our sins were laid upon him and he bore them, even though he had never sinned. Because of this great sacrifice, upon conditions of our repentance, we can share in the Savior's righteousness. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, provided, or provided this explanation of Paul's teachings about reconciliation. Quote, reconciliation is the process of ransoming man from his state of sin and spiritual darkness and of restoring him to a state of harmony and unity with deity. Though it God and man are no through it through it God and man are no longer enemies. Man who was once carnal evil, who lived after the man of the flesh, becomes a new creature of the Holy Ghost. He is born again, and even as a little child he is alive in Christ. Reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil and the flesh, Jacob taught. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. 2 Nephi 10.24 Let's now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 2. 
Now is the day of salvation, after describing how all mankind may be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, Paul exhorted the Corinthian saints to be faithful, teaching that now is the day of salvation. The Book of Mormon contains similar teachings about the importance of repenting and remaining true to the gospel covenants in this life. 2 Nephi 2.21, Alma 34.31-33, and Alma 42.4. Individuals who do not honor the gospel covenants in this life should not assume that they will have a second chance in the life to come. That is significant. Do not assume that, oh, it's okay, I'll just get another chance in the spirit world. That is not the doctrine. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, Whenever the gospel is offered to any person or group, they then have the obligation to believe and obey its doctrine. Otherwise, they do not become inheritors of its blessings. The doctrine of salvation for the dead, great and glorious as it is, does not mean that those who reject the truth or who disobey their gospel covenants in this life shall have a second chance to gain salvation by accepting and living the law in the spirit world. Salvation for the dead is for those who died without a knowledge of the gospel and who would have received it with all their hearts had it been presented to them in this mortal life. To Joseph Smith, the Lord said that those who reject the gospel in this life and receive it in the spirit world shall go not to a celestial, but to a terrestrial kingdom. And using some of the same language which Paul here records, Amulek summarized the true doctrine by saying, Now is the time and the day of your salvation. For behold, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. Do not procrastinate procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. Alma 34, 31-33. A very significant doctrine. When those of us that have the gospel... This is our time and our chance to work on and to become like Christ. We don't get second ones if we already have a chance here. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 through 10, ministers of God. In 2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 10, Paul described the way he and his missionary companions endeavored to serve as ministers of God and alluded to many of the hardships they had faced. Paul's description of his ministry can be seen as a list of attributes of effective ministers that we can strive to emulate in our own service, attributes that are best exemplified by the Lord Jesus Christ. Similar lists are found in Doctrine and Covenants 4, 5-6, through 6, which says, And faith, hope, charity, love, with an eye single to the glory of God, qualifieth him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. And Doctrines 121, 41 through 44. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost and then showing forth afterwards an increase of love towards him whom, whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy, that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, we avoid all conduct which might bring reproach upon our ministry. That's what Paul is trying to say. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4, minister of God, Paul is saying, legal administrators who hold the priesthood and are thereby, thereby endow, empowered to represent the Lord, doing saying what he wants done and said for the salvation of his earthly children. All true ministers are, in a sense, prophets. They have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. 
They all receive revelation, all have the gifts of the Holy Ghost, all enjoy the gifts of the Spirit, and all put first in their lives the things of God's kingdom. They are both servants and friends of the Lord, and they act in His place and stead in their inspired ministrations. And try, on the contrary, to commend ourselves by acting as true ministers of God. Approving ourselves, that is, by our conduct and the various circumstances detailed. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5, The apostle's desire to commend him, himself is shown in endurance of hardship and trouble in the persecutions and dangers incidental to a missionary life. This is our aim in all the trials and persecutions we endure. Second Corinthians 6.6, 6, By the way of the Holy Ghost, Paul was saying, No man is or can be a minister of Christ unless he has received the gift and enjoys the presentment of the Holy Ghost. It is by this gift that the Lord reveals to each faithful person what he would do and say in any given situation. Without this revealed knowledge, none can resent represent the Lord with power and authority. Second Corinthians chapter 6, 7, by the power of God, Paul meaning the priesthood. No man can be a minister of Christ unless he holds the Aaronic or the Melchizedek priesthood. For these very orders of divine authority are the commission which deity gives to his agents to represent him. Second Corinthians 6, 8, Paul is saying true ministers are always considered by men to be deceivers and dishonorable, while in fact they are both honorable and true. It's sad that the true ministers are seen by those as deceived and dishonorable, and the ministers that are deceivers and dishonorable are seen as true ministers by the wicked. Certain Corinthians 6, 9. We are looked upon as deceivers, but we remain true. We are obscure, but known by our work. We are often at death's door, but through God's grace we live. Second Corinthians six ten, making many rich, meaning seek not for riches but for wisdom, and behold the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then ye shall be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. Doctrine and Covenants six seven. Possessing all things, meaning not in this life, but eventually in eternity. All things are theirs, whether life or death, or things, or things present, or things to come. All are theirs, and they are Christ, and Christ is God's. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 59. We will one day receive all things in the next life. Well, the righteous. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Ye are straightened in your own bowels. As used in Scripture, the word bowels often refers to inner source, into, refers to the inner source of piety, love, and kindness. Because when we feel love or compassion, we often experience strong inner feelings. In 2 Corinthians six twelve, the idea of straightening, which means narrowing, one's bowels means to restrict or withhold love. When Paul said, ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels, he was telling the Corinthian saints that there was no lack of love on his part, despite the fact that some of the saints were apparently withholding their love from him. Similarly, use of the word bowels in the New Testament are found in Philippians 1.8, 2.1, Colossians 3.12, and 1 John 3.17. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Paul used the imagery of animals yoked together as he discouraged church members from being yoked together with unbelievers. The law of Moses forbade the yoking of an ox and an ass together. You can see that in Deuteronomy 22, 10. So that the weaker animal would not hold the stronger one back and the stronger animal would not inflict pain or discomfort on the weaker one. What associations can the saints maintain without, with outsiders without departing from gospel standards? Can they participate in cocktail parties, publish pornographic literature, attend indecent plays and movies, work for institutions whose major purpose is to fight the truth and destroy the influence of the church? Without 
legislating on any specific case in persuasive and powerful language, Paul here prescribes and excoriates improper alliances, affiliations, and associations with the world, leaving to each individual the need to choose the course he personally will follow. Latter-day prophets have applied Paul's teachings to be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers as a guiding principle in forming relationship with others, including deciding whom to marry. For example, President Spencer W. Kimball discussed why it is important for Latter-day Saints to marry within their faith. You are taking a desperate chance if you say, well, maybe he will join after we are married. We will go ahead and try it and see. It is a pretty, pretty serious th thing to take a chance on. Over the years, many times, women have come to me in tears. How they would love to train their children to church in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they were unable to do so. How they would like to accept positions of responsibility in the church. How they would like to pay their tithing. How they would love to go to the temple and do the work for the dead, to do work for themselves, to be sealed for eternity, and to have their own flesh and blood, their children sealed to them for eternity. No implication is here made that all members of the church are worthy and that all non-members are unworthy. But eternal marriage cannot be had outside of the temple, and non-members are not permitted to go into the temple. Paul said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion with light with darkness? Perhaps Paul wanted them to see that religious differences are fundamental differences. End of President Kimball's quote. 2 Corinthians 6.15, Christ with Belial. Here used as a synonym for the devil in such expressions as sons of Belial, meaning men of Belial, meaning wicked men. 2 Corinthians 6, 14-18, Be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Paul compared the Corinthian saints to the temple of the living God. See 2 Corinthians 6, 16. He then discouraged them from entering into relationships with idol worshippers or participating in their unclean practices. With these teachings, Paul reiterated a promise made to God's people of old, that if they would come out from among the wicked, God would dwell among them and be their God. 2 Corinthians 6.17 This is also in Exodus 25.8, Leviticus 26.11-12, Jeremiah 32.38, and Ezekiel 11.19-20. Paul usage of three Old Testament scriptures illustrates how an inspired author can paraphrase scriptural passages so as to explain, amplify, and clarify their meaning. To Israel, by the mouth of Moses, God said, And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Leviticus 26.12 Which Paul interpreted to mean that God, by the power of his Spirit, would dwell in his people. That's verse 16 in chapter 6. To Latter-day Saints, from the lips of Isaiah, speaking of fleeing from Babylon and gathering to Zion, the Lord said, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch not unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Isaiah 52, 11, which Paul applied to the need of the saints in his day to be separate from the world. That's what he was trying to say in verse 17. Speaking to gathered Israel in latter days, God said through Hosea, Ye are sons of the living God, Hosea 1.10, which Paul interpreted to mean that God would be a father unto Israel, both to her sons and to her daughters. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Godly sorrow for sin leads to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, filthiness of the flesh and spirit. It is the body or is it the body or the spirit that commits sin? In pre-existence, it was the spirit only. In this life, the spirit is clothed with the tabernacle, which is subject to the lust of the flesh. That is mortal appetites, encouraged sin. 
but the mind of man and the will to act are in the spirit. Hence, body and spirit join in the commission of sin and both become unclean thereby. 2 Corinthians 7, 2-7, Paul had wronged no man. In 2 Corinthians 7, 2-7, Paul continued his defense against those who sought to discredit him. He assured the Corinthian saints that he had not wronged or defrauded anyone. He pointed out that news of their well-being had brought him such joy that he was able to endure such serious trials in Macedonia, that's northern Greece. 2 Corinthians 7, 4, I am exceedingly joyful in all tribulations. Paul was trying to say, as part of their moral probation, the saints are called upon to pass through tribulations. That is to undergo severe afflictions, distress, and deep sorrow. In the world ye shall have tribulation, our Lord said, John 16, 33. Tribulation worketh patience, Romans 5, 3, Dr. Covenant 54, 10. And it is only through much tribulation that men may enter into the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. He that is faithful in tribulation, the reward of the same is greater in the kingdom of heaven. You cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. For after much tribulation come the blessings. Doctrine and Covenants 58, 24 and 103, 12. Exalted beings are described in these words. These are they which come out of great tribulation and have washed their robe and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's Revelation 7, 14. The saints glory in tribulation. Romans 5, 3 and Doctrine and Covenants 1, 27, 2. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Elder Neil, Mayak, Neil A. Maxwell stated, Even having so chosen God, however, we cannot expect immunity from anxiety or challenge. On one occasion, Paul described his weariness and feelings with considerable candor. Paul said, For when we were in come in Ma into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. We were fightings within, were fears, 2 Corinthians 7, 5. Therefore, notwithstanding our weakness, our task is to improve the world in God's way then, rather than to be merely conformed to this world. We are to be transformed, Romans 12, 2, and to be transformers, including in such unusual circumstances as those that will finally shake even the kingdom of the devil in order that those which belong to us must needs be served up unto repentance. 2 Nephi 28, 19. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 11, Godly sorrow worketh patience. One of Paul's purposes in writing earlier epistles to the saints of Corinth was to call certain individuals to repentance. It is evident from 2 Corinthians 7, 8-13 that his correspondence had been well received because according to Paul, the saints had sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorrow after a godly manner. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. For more scriptural teachings on godly sorrow, you can see 2 Nephi 2, 7, Isaiah 4, 1-3, and Alma 42, 29-30. President Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, Godly sorrow is a gift of the Spirit. It is a deep realization that our actions have offended our Father and our God. It is the sharp and keen awareness that our behavior caused the Savior, who knew no sin, even the greatest of all, to endure agony and suffering. Our sins caused him to bleed at every pore. This very real mental and spiritual anguish is what the scriptures refer to as having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Such a spirit is the absolute prerequisite for true repentance. Brothers and sisters, you and I are all responsible for those drops of blood that he sweated. Godly sorrow is different. This is continuing President Benson, from worldly sorrow, because it includes the workings of the Spirit in our hearts and causes real and lasting change. 
Worldly sorrow is a feeling of regret over being caught in a misdeed or having to face unpleasant consequences. Godly sorrow includes an honest, heartfelt contrition of soul, a contrition born of broken heart and a contrite spirit. It presupposes a frank personal acknowledgement that one's acts have been evil in the sight of him who is holy. There is no mental reservation in godly sorrow, no feeling that perhaps one's sins are not as gross or serious after all. It is certainly more than regret either because the sin has been brought to light or because some preferential reward or status has been lost because of it. Elder Nelly Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, pointed out, Pride prefers cheap repentance, paid for with shallow sorrow. Unsurprisingly, seekers after cheap repentance also search for superficial forgiveness instead of real reconciliation. Thus, real repentance goes far beyond simply saying, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. In verse 11, Paul is saying, Your own repentance is a case in point. Yours was a godly sorrow as the result proclaimed. For it made you earnest to amend your ways, anxious to clear yourselves, indignant that you had been misled, afraid of the results of your conduct, anxious to see me, zealous for truth and righteousness, resolute in purifying the church. In every respect, you showed that you had no share in the offender's guilt and no desire to shield him. Verse 12, Paul is saying, and this was the very purpose of that severe letter, not to secure the punishment of the offender or to satisfy the resentment of the injured, but to cause you to recognize before God the feelings of affliction and devotion, I'm sorry, the feelings of affection and devotion with which you are really regarded me. Verse 12, for this cause that had done the wrong, for this cause that suffered wrong. Paul is referring that reference, of course, was obvious to the reader without particulars, but we are ignorant of some of the facts. It would seem that on the occasion of this brief visit, Paul had been attacked and denounced by some leaders of the disaffection in the church, or else that Timothy, on the occasion of his visit, had been the object of blame, and that in either case Paul had insisted upon the punishment of the offender. This had now been done. The doer of the wrong here is this leader of rebellion, and the sufferer either Paul or Timothy. Verse 13, Now that all has ended well, I am thankful, and my joy is increased, because Titus also rejoices at your attitude. Verse 14, for all that I said to him in you, praise has been justified, and I am not ashamed of my boasting. Verse 15, And the affection of Titus for you has increased since he visited you and saw your anxiety to do well. In verse 16, I rejoice therefore that I have every confidence in you. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. I know that was probably longer than some have been, but Paul teaches some great teachings concerning our discipleship, our commitment, our sufferings and afflictions that will happen in mortality, our reactions to them, and the tests of our faith. May we pass those tests with flying colors. Again, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.